I ask that you go with me to Romans chapter 1, and I'll be reading the first seven verses. Romans chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his namesake, among whom you also are the called of God. To all the saints, to all who are beloved of God, rather, to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Romans has been called the fifth gospel. It is arranged differently than the, than the first gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yet Paul here, who did not write a gospel himself, although we suspect that Luke leaned heavily upon the instruction and the, what he learned from Paul in order that he might write his gospel, the gospel of Luke, Paul takes a different approach as he comes here to the book of Romans, and many see, don't see the same gospel presentation. But yet, I think that that word which is given, the fifth gospel account, is very appropriate. We do not have a full account of Bethlehem, such as Matthew and Luke give us, and we do not have the details of parables and of miracles such as all of the Gospels give us, or such as what each Gospel gives us in the lead-up to the week of Passion and to the crucifixion of our Lord and then his resurrection. But yet, Paul, in a thematic, in a topical manner, he brings us to the very same message of Christ and the centrality of the Gospel. Romans is very different from the other letters which Paul wrote. The other letters were addressed to churches which Paul had himself either begun or churches which he had a vital impact in or people such as Philemon or Timothy or Titus who he had poured himself into. But Rome, Romans is different because Paul had not yet been there. That is rather strange when you think that Paul himself was a Roman, but you did not have to be born physically or geographically in the city of Rome in order to bear a Roman citizenship. That was something that could be received from your parents or in other ways rather than being born within the parameters of the city of Rome. So here Paul, a Roman citizen, having never been to Rome itself, he is writing in advance of wanting to go there and he is eager to have the help of the believers there in the city of Rome as he is setting his sights upon Spain. He wants to carry the gospel where the word of the message of Christ has never yet been proclaimed. He has Spain in his eye. He is preached in what we now regard as Turkey and also in Greece. He has labored there and he has ministered and churches have been established. It's an exciting story that we read through the pages of the book of Acts. But now Paul, he is looking to new fields, places where people have not yet heard of Jesus Christ and of his power to save. The very same message and the very same power that came upon the apostle Paul 
when he was yet the man Saul and an emissary of the Sanhedrin making his way to Damascus, there on that road he was stopped in his tracks and his life was changed. Paul knew that if he could be transformed by the power of the gospel, hard as his heart was against the gospel and against the person and the work of Jesus Christ and the cross, he knew that there was hope for each and every one. And he wanted to carry the message. He wanted it to go as far afield as he could possibly reach. Spain was in his heart. Spain was in his eye. But to pass by Rome and to receive the encouragement and the help. One writer who I especially enjoyed reading about Rome, he said, actually, Romans is like a missionary appeal letter. It's the longest missionary appeal letter that perhaps was ever written. Most of them are one or two or three pages at most. Here we have Paul writing to the church in Rome, to the believers who had come to faith in Christ through the ministry of others, but Paul is appealing to them. And he is laying out the gospel of God. And he is saying, this is what we rejoice in. This is what we delight in. And would you please help me as I take this very message to those over there to the west of you, over in Spain, who have not yet heard this glorious message of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul begins in the first seven verses and there is reference here to Jesus coming to be born in Bethlehem. There are no shepherds. There are no magi or wise men. There is no account of the angels who came to Nazareth and spoke to Mary and to Joseph and say, look, this is of God. I know that you are rattled. I know that your whole world seems to be falling apart at what is taking place, but this is of God. God is at work, and you have the privilege of being a part of the very work of God. In these first seven verses, Paul is starting in, and I want you to consider this with me. Very often, we rush past the introductions to the letters of Paul and others as though, well, he's just sort of starting off, he's just sort of getting into what he wants to say, and the real meat comes later on. And this we just sort of bear with. Paul is identifying himself, he's identifying who he is addressing, and perhaps some introductory words of formality. No, no, here Paul is speaking vital words, and I think it's good for us to nourish our own hearts from them to receive the message which God has for us. Paul, he identifies himself as elsewhere as a bondservant of Christ Jesus. That, when before Paul was on the Damascus Road, that was the very last thing that Paul would have as the man Saul the last thing that he would have identified himself as or that he would ever want to identify himself as. But here, with joy, with gladness, he says, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus had bought him. Paul was a purchased man. A price had been paid on Calvary's cross. Paul knew it. A bondservant, one who has been purchased by Jesus Christ, called as an apostle set apart for the gospel of God. It was a high privilege which had been given to Paul that he would be called as an apostle, that is, as a sent one, one who was sent with a message. The message was so glorious, Paul, in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14, he would say, 
God forbid that I should ever glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. There was nothing in this world. His heritage was amazing. His education was remarkable. There were connections which he had in this world, but he said, I am not going to glory in any of those things. I am going to glory only in the cross. And here, Paul, he says, I've been called as an apostle. That was not a heavy burden and he was not here saying oh woe is me I've been I've been called and and tasked with this burden it was a high privilege he says set apart for the gospel of God again it was something whereby he said this is a privilege this is an honor that has been given to me it was the gospel of God which God promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. This was foreordained. Earlier in our message, or in our service, we've talked about uh, Isaiah chapters 9, chapters 11, and elsewhere, it is spoken of how that this gospel would come. And it was foretold. It was not simply foretold, but it was foretold, and this is what Paul is referring to here. It was promised beforehand. It is written in the Holy Scriptures. Verse 3, concerning his son. Paul makes a beeline for Jesus Christ. Verse 1, verse 2, verse 3. Here, the beeline is away from himself and to Jesus. Paul is not wanting people to have their eyes set upon him. He is rather wanting people to see the glory and the splendor of his master, of Jesus Christ. Concerning his son, God's son, who was born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh. Here at the outset of Romans, the fifth gospel, here we have Jesus coming from the glories of heaven down such a precipitous fall, you might say, to Bethlehem via Nazareth that he might be born, that he might be understood in worldly terms, earthly terms, to be the son of Mary and Joseph. Now, Joseph knew that Jesus was not his child, but yet he took upon himself the responsibility for raising this boy. And Mary knew that it was a wonder. The angel had come to her and said, Hail Mary! And so Mary understood also that this child was different from every every child who had ever been born, that she had not bent the rules of morality, that God was indeed at work. But concerning Jesus, concerning the Son of God, born of a descendant of David, Mary and Joseph there, both tracing their lineage back to the royal house of David, Verse 4, declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. In an, a blink of time, we are taken from Bethlehem and raced through the life of Jesus, approximately 33 years. We are raced through from the one end to the other. We are taken from Bethlehem to the empty tomb, you might say, from a vacant womb to an empty and vacant tomb. Here we have Jesus who came to inhabit the womb of the virgin and then that tomb which, in which no man had ever been laid from the one to the other. 
And Jesus Christ is a wonder from whichever angle you look at him. Or from whether you start from the beginning or whether you look to the end, Jesus is indeed a wonder. Jesus declared the Son of God with power. With power. The resurrection was something which was so spectacular just as the incarnation that it was only God who could accomplish such things. Declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, this work of God has an impact upon our hearts and our lives. You can't say, well, so what? It's an interesting story. It's a beautiful story. The, the babe who was born in Bethlehem, and then it's, it's a story of tragedy, how that he was taken by rough hands and he was crucified, but how exciting it is that he comes alive from the dead, but it really has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with us 2,000 years later. You see, Jesus Christ did not come to be born in Bethlehem because he was looking for an excursion. He did not come from heaven to this earth to check out things because he was bored and because he was looking for some type of a tourist experience. He came for your desperate need and the desperate need of my own heart. He became the son of Joseph, the son of Mary. He took upon himself flesh and blood in order that, as we have made our way through the book of Hebrews, in order that he might become the merciful and faithful high priest that we desperately needed in order to make the sacrifice which had never been made. All of the sacrifices in the Old Testament were pointing forward to what Christ would make. All of those imperfect, incomplete sacrifices, they were a foreshadowing of that one, one perfect sacrifice that Christ would make upon Calvary's cross Again, not because of his sin, but he was the sinless one dying in place of the sinful, the, those who were full of sin. So here we have Jesus Christ coming incarnate, the incarnation, God taking upon himself flesh and blood that he might be our faithful high priest our merciful high priest, and that he might step forward to the very throne of God, to that true tabernacle in heaven, and that he might present his own perfect, pure, sinless blood for our atonement, and that he might be raised again from the dead in the resurrection. And what does it mean? It means that through this work which he has accomplished, not as God sitting in heaven, but as God coming in flesh to move among us, to live among us, to sense the desperate need of our hearts, that he might do what verse 5 says, he is the one through whom we have received grace, and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. Because Jesus Christ has come, he has provided salvation for us. He is the one who has extended grace to us and mercy and kindness. It is because of this that we have salvation and that we are called into his service, into apostleship, to take this message now to others. Paul says, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom all things are through our Lord Jesus Christ, and that is whom has, who has made us 
unbelievably wealthy in spiritual terms. Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. Spain isn't mentioned here. You have to wait till the end of Romans. But even now, Paul is thinking of those Gentiles in Spain that he wants to hear the message of Jesus Christ. And he is going to move directly in that point in order that they might hear and that those in Rome might link arms with him. And verse 6 says, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Now, see what Paul is doing here. In verse 1, Paul has identified himself as one who has been called as an apostle. And then in verse 6, he says that these to whom he is writing are the called of Jesus Christ. Both of them have a calling upon their lives. Paul, he was a very unique individual, one who has written so much of the New Testament. Many of those people in Rome, they didn't probably write much at all, certainly nothing that is included within the pages of our scriptures, but yet God had a place and a purpose for them each one having a call upon their life. Paul is saying that he was called as one who was to go and to proclaim, and he is reaching out to these people, just as I said, to link arms. He is reaching out to them to say, help me, help me in sending forth the gospel, not just to those who you live nearby there in Rome or other parts, of the known world and the Roman Empire, help me in order that we might fulfill the calling which is upon each of our lives and that we might praise God. Then verse 7, to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints. Just this past week, I received a question from a Faith to Live By viewer who was asking, should we, as believers in Christ, refer to ourselves as sinners or saints? I'm going to answer that question very soon on The Bible Has the Answer, but here is how that I'm going to answer it. If we continue to refer to ourselves as sinners, we deprecate and we depreciate the work which Jesus Christ has done for us. Jesus said, it is finished. He was saying, I have bought men and women out of the slave market of sin in order that they might be the sons and daughters of God. If we say, well, no, actually, we're still sinners, we're still all messed up. Now, positionally, that may be uh, true that we are still a long way to go and until we get to heaven there will be that struggle with sin but when Jesus Christ comes and the gavel comes down and we are declared right with God we are justified before the court of heaven we do heaven and our Savior a horrible disservice we in fact, uh, discredit the work of Calvary if we go about and say, well, I'm just a sinner, just a sinner. We are called saints. Here, the Apostle Paul says, to all who are beloved of God in Rome, you have been given a new name, saints. That is holy ones. And that is exactly who you are. And Paul says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ 
He has come that troubled hearts might know the peace of God. He has come that grace might be extended, the grace that we could never have worked for or obtained by our own efforts, but the grace of God which reaches the last and the least, the lost, wherever they are, the prodigals, the grace of God has come, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know this peace? You can know it today, and it can be a blessing in your heart. It can take root. It can do its marvelous work. It all starts when we see in Bethlehem not just a little baby born in a strange place where you wouldn't expect a baby to be born. You would expect more antiseptic surroundings and a little bit more compassion by the innkeeper. But see rather the Son of God who has come, humbling himself that we might be lifted up. Jesus Christ came from the glories of heaven to dwell in this earth in order that the sons of earth who knew nothing but the grime and the dirt of sin and of this world, that we might be lifted up and that we might, be, that we might receive a new name, and that name is saints. Having received the grace of God, having taken hold of it, having been cleansed by the power of God, having been raised up by the power of the resurrection, we have this privilege in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I invite you to rejoice in that today. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for the privilege of hearing from your word and of being strengthened by it. Lord, may we, through this time, understand the greatness of your work and may we ever more rejoice in it and that it has direct impact upon our lives and our hearts called as saints may we rejoice in that evermore we pray in jesus name amen <laughs>